Hey everyone out there on YouTube, welcome to the show show, pre-show show, cocktail hour. This month we're talking Farscape. I'm Jay, that's Aaron. Hey. And that's Tony. Hello, hello. Uh, today I have for you the the John Crichton. The, the I... John Crichton cocktail? <laughs> Yes, <laughs> it's gotten. It doesn't have any chocolate in it, unfortunately, because uh, chocolate's kind of tough to to get into a cocktail that, that I haven't been able to do that very well. Or an intergalactic space. <laughs> so I uh, I infused some vodka with some starbursts, mm -hmm. uh, some strawberry ones, and some. I think it was the fruit punch ones. I can't remember. Is there anything uh, more Australian American than starbursts? The pink ones. Hmm. That's a good question. Fosters? <laughs> I don't know if that's Australian American. <laughs> Outback Steakhouse? <laughs> yeah, Outback Steakhouse. You should have infused it with Outback Steakhouse flavors. <laughs> Blooming onion. Yeah. You at least should have, should have had that on the side. Why? So why is this the John Crichton in your mind? Uh, it's because it's based on a Tom Collins, which is a classic... American cocktail. It's okay. basically like a like a fancy gin lemonade. Okay. So it's it's calling back to a past that no one really remembers. <laughs> okay, I like that. It's got elements of uh, a brighter future, and you know, I, I, Starburst was kind of obvious. <laughs> fair, fair. I got. I like it all. I like it all. I don't have a cocktail. I have a, a Mountain Dew. I don't know if that's very um, um farscapey, but. It's tasty. It like OG Mountain Dew? No, I'm definitely drinking the zero sugar. I don't know why my local grocer like keeps oscillating between diet Mountain Dew and zero sugar. Like number one, do you just have a glut of diet Mountain Dew and you just have to like <laughs> rotate through it every once in a while to keep everybody <laughs> like sa satiated or, or what? But like this time it was, it was zero sugar and I like that one a little bit better. So. Nice. And similar, I'm drinking a zero sugar starry. They're not that great. They're too that's lemony. That's new one. Yeah, they're too lemony and not that much limey. I heard that's that, that's what's replaced. What was it? What was it used to be called? Sierra that Mist. That was Pepsi's. Sierra Mist. This yeah. Place. I mean, it might be better than Sierra Mist, but it's still not that great. I'm just kind of <laughs> trying to get rid of them. Do Do you remember the Sierra Mist commercials? Like the ones back in the uh, mid early 2000s, maybe. You'll have to jog my memory. Uh, I feel like it had something to do with like a, a like a snow beast in the mountains. I'll have to look it up. They were weird and surreal. There was a bunch of weird commercials coming out in that time period. <laughs> like the Quiznos ones with the gerbils. <laughs> yeah, there's some weird <laughs> oh, I ones. Those, yeah. Man, I miss Quiznos. Oh, I miss Quiznos. Prime rim and peppercorn on rosemary. Ooh. Mm. Classic Italian. I remember the people at Quiznos got mad whenever I gave them a sandwich and it was like, I don't want this, but I do want this. Add the extra of that. They're like, the sandwich is supposed to come the way the sandwich comes, dude. <laughs> I was like, what are you, a sandwich artist? And he was like, yeah, I am. <laughs> well, uh, before we get into the show proper, I, I want to go around the horn real quick. And I wanted to ask you guys, uh, Aaron, uh, have you ever uh, paid hush money to a porn star? I'm so indicted. I have not. I I keep all of my hush money on the hush hush. So, yeah, fair enough. How about you, Tony? Under advice of counsel, I've determined not to answer that question. Well, it's over three on the show show. So, <laughs> <laughs> you guys want to talk about Farscape? <laughs> yes. Well, let's indict something else. <clears throat> ah. All right, you got it. All right, I am going to open up my notes app, and then we'll be off and running. I have definitely learned way more about black holes in the last week because, you know, I'm interested in them for some reason. And so, mm. I like wormholes, definitely not how they're portrayed in the show. I want to hear more about that. We will get into it. Previously on The Show Show. Tony, any, any thoughts on, on season one? Uh, yeah. Is it a white trash sitcom? It looks like a white trash sitcom when I see the, the pictures come up on Hulu. It was too intense for me the first season. Like There wasn't enough like pressure release. I've got a very dumb question. Sure. Show us your tits! And stuff like that. Overt 
homosexual like overtones like you said it was just tropes you know the the long horn on the car when was the last time that you ever saw a long horn in the front of a car well you're not worried like on traffic if someone gets mad they're gonna shoot you I was like, no, because no, nobody has time for that right now. Like, if, like everybody's trying to get somewhere. And- I think Jay and I told the salary man in Japan that we had horses and rode to rode to our workplace. You guys are such trolls. Hey, hot tea wasn't bad. Huh? I want to go with daddy and have some hot tea. They have those men's retreats where they hand out a sling and they're like, you're a warrior, gird your loins up, and 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 face off against your challenges, your giants. I'm 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 the most redeemed out of the three of us, just so you know. Ooh, under which storyline is the in fact bad guy? I want a more uh Walton Goggins. I, I will say I do watch Naruto on Hulu. I will say, I will say, I I will also, I was going to say, I will also say, I will, I will also say, I will say, who's the girl that's saying I kissed a girl and I, and I liked it? It was Katy Perry. Katy Perry. Left shark. Left shark. <laughs> left shark. I, you totally threw me. I, I was going <laughs> to make a reference. Now I've lost it because you threw the left shark at me. Came, oh, I'm sorry. It came out of left shark. <laughs> Hello, hello, and welcome to the show show, probably the world's best TV review podcast. Welcome to episode 58. Today we review the first season of the 1999 classic sci-fi series from the minds of Rockney S. O'Bannon and Brian Henson. It's not Kansas, and you're way too homely to be Annie M. This month on the show show, Farscape. I'd like to welcome you inside the broadcast booth. I'm Jay. I'm joined, as always, by my two Hall of Famers. To my left, a Luxon warrior hiding a tragic past. It's Aaron. Howdy. And to my right, the special peacekeeper commando, Ikiron Company, Plysar Regiment. It's Tony. Happy to be here. Check out our Instagram for news about the show, including our postponed 2023 tour and cruise, along with plenty of of bonus content you can find that at the show show pod send your emails to the show show tv podcast at gmail.com find us on youtube if you're not there already for the mandamus radio page how do you say that our page is called mandamus radio (laughs) you gotta do it you gotta do it you can find me individually at jesu esponte aaron where can we find you on the ever shrinking musco verse at tenacious aaron how about you, Tony? At Teepin Quiet on Instagram. Uh, before we go to the other side of the universe, let's talk about the unofficial scoreboard. What have you been watching? What have you guys been doing since uh, we convened on the Righteous Gemstones? Tony, what's been up? Not a lot. I did see John Wick 4. It was pretty good. I think I had it too, too hyped in my head because everything I'd seen is like this is like mind-blowingly awesome it is really good but it's not i don't don't go don't go in too high on it is what i'll say but it is still really good mm. how about you Aaron? so farscape had you know kind of lit the sci-fi fire number one and so uh, me and christy watched life the the movie with uh, ryan reynolds and jake gyllenhaal which i had not ever seen which i really enjoyed we also it rekindled our our drive into mass effect 2 We played through all of Mass Effect 1 together, and we had started to, but it just kind of like, we started too quickly right after 1, and it kind of trailed off. After getting a couple episodes into Farscape, we were really just kind of digging the sci-fi vibe, and so we picked that back up and started going back through the story, and that's been a lot of fun, um, kind of uh, reliving kind of some, you know, nostalgia. I really like that series, and it really fits in well with a lot of the Farscape kind of motifs and themes with you know, going around, getting a bunch of aliens in a ship and going around doing missions. So uh, it's been a lot of fun on that front. Uh, on another side, um, I'm a, you know, an avid traded in card uh, connoisseur. 
and uh, a new trading card game that I've been getting into called Flesh and Blood, which is from New Zealand. Um, uh, just had a new release, and I've uh, been having fun messing around with that. So that that has been what I have been up to lately. Did you play the Diablo Four beta? I did play the Diablo Four yeah. beta. I played both. I played both days um, or both weekends, and I did enjoy it. Um, I played Barbarian Weekend One, uh, which was a uh, uh, pain in the ass. But uh, once I grouped up with people, it was a lot more fun. So um, I really enjoyed the Necromancer. That that was a lot of fun to just run around with some skelly boys blowing shit up. What did you do? Did you do Diablo also? Yeah, I came in late. Like I think I only got on the second weekend and just on Sunday. So I binged for like, I don't know, like four to six hours probably on Sunday trying to only got up to like the teen levels. But yeah, I went Necro and I messed around too it's much fun. before I got Corpse Explosion. And I was like, oh man, this is like click to delete. Right <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I wanted to be yeah. rogue, but my buddy was rogue. I'm like, I don't want two rogues. So I'm like, I'll try the Necro. You saw how the talent trees work, though. Like, you could have gone down just a kind of a different path yeah. than him, and you probably wouldn't have really noticed any different. Like, y'all would have been able to enjoy what you were doing, right? Yeah, I just got on late. I was trying to catch up on levels, but it was fun. I'm going to hold off if I can. I'm scared of, like, Blizzard Activision monetization on it. Like, I'm worried they're going to, like, wait for a month, maybe two months, and they're going to drop, like... XP boosters for money or something like that. I don't know. I I don't doubt that there's going to be some level of monetization, but I think you're probably more likely to see battle passes with like a bunch of cosmetic stuff because of the like I don't disagree with you like they're probably going to have some XP bonuses, but I bet you it's not going to be until after the first season. Yeah, that's what they're supposed to do, just cosmetic only. So hopefully they Hold to it. Yeah, I agree. Jay, what about you? What were you doing in the in the interim? Mm. Farscape took up quite a lot of uh, my my attention in a good way, of course. Mm. Uh, but the one thing that I have been watching is the new season of Party Down. Oh, what do you think? G- good, very good. Mm. Not as good as the original run. It's it's hard to capture the the magic again. <laughs> yeah, but like. You know, like 80, 90% as good. And I might go out on a limb and say the best revival that's been done yet. Wow. Okay. Now that, that means I gotta do a little homework. I need to rewatch season one and two and then watch this now. Well, maybe that's just about more about the lack of quality in the other revivals <laughs> that have happened. Because, like, what has has there been another good one? Has there been? I, okay, I thought I will say this. Now, this is unfair, but Farscape has had a couple of revivals that have been good. Not Farscape, uh, Futurama. Sorry, I'm looking at Farscape reading things while we're talking about this. So, um, Futurama has come back a couple of times, and I honestly have very high hopes for it coming back another time with Hulu. So, okay. but again, that's that's animation, that's voice acting, that's. Mm-hmm. I think a little gives a little bit more like because it's going to be relevant to whatever the pop culture is at the time, it lends itself to like being relevant. Right. Mm-hmm. So whereas some of these shows like, you know, Arrested Development coming back. Yeah. It was good to see everyone together again and, and all the, the bit pieces, but you're right. It just is like, it felt out of place. Right. Mm-hmm. This was a show for the mid- early two thousands when, you know, things were in that weird kind of post nine eleven funk, and we needed satire to to break the ice. <laughs> Could I be any more alive? Oh yeah, like culture had moved on at that point. It really did. Like, like it just it just felt culturally irrelevant anymore. And Party Down did a pretty good job of of having some updates, where it's it still has a very central theme about following your dreams, and at what point does that become ridiculous? And there's a new character who's a Gen Z influencer, a, a content creator. Mm-hmm. And the interplay between him and the, the older cast members who just don't understand what that is, that, that was very good. That was a good part of the revival. Okay, yeah. That, I, I, like, I'm sorry, I like stuff like that. I definitely like whenever they take old, old perspectives from, like, the 90s or 2000s and kind of, like, update them. Um, 
uh, Rocco's Modern Life. If you watched that on Nickelodeon back in the day, I I was a fan. They did a um, like a, a little like mini episode type thing where it was brought to the modern era, and that's I thought that was pretty cool. Oh wow, <laughs> that sounds trippy. <laughs> It, yeah, it, doesn't it? Like making Rocco's Modern Life today about with all the things that are happening today with social media and all that stuff. Huh. Wow, I can't picture it. And, Ro- and Rocco's Modern Life crossed, crossed some boundaries, if you remember. Yeah. <laughs> all right, well, I think that's it for our unofficial scoreboard. Uh, anybody spot a wormhole? <laughs> uh, uh, not one that's not a hologram. <laughs> Well, this uh, this was an Aaron pick, so tell us about Farscape, Aaron. So uh, I I said that I love this show, and I, I definitely thoroughly enjoyed watching it again. And it, it, all I can think of is that scene in Community where Abed gets the water thrown in his face, and the guy's like, why are you <laughs> sitting here letting me talk to you? He's like, well, I really like talking about Farscape. It's a really good show. Stargate's better. <laughs> so I'm really excited for the, the next, like, you know, 30, 40 minutes. Next but, couple of arms. Yeah, um, but... Essentially, Farscape is a, a sci-fi original series that was done by the Jim Henson Company, and it is apparently Australian-American. I did not know that until today, so that that caught me by surprise. But essentially, it's the story of John Crichton, who's an American scientist that works for I- ISA, <laughs> the International Astronomical Science. I don't know. Like, it's basically NASA, but with I. Um, and... Fair use NASA. Yeah. He he is testing out this theory he has about slingshotting a spaceship around a planet, which I don't I didn't they didn't really explain what the theory was, just that there was a theory and he was trying it with his theoretical ship, and it accidentally shoots him into a wormhole. And that wormhole takes him to a galaxy far, far away. No trademark infringement. When he comes out of the wormhole, he immediately smashes into a spaceship which causes it to, well, no, he immediately gets smashed into by a spaceship, yeah. which causes it to ricochet off into a asteroid. He then gets, you know, uh, tethered. They didn't really explain that. They just kind of like... Uh, something drew, web, right? Like Yeah, some type it. of like, they called it something web. Yeah, some type of web that, that brought his ship on board to Moya, which is a giant metallic living ship, as the intro says over and over again. And on, on this ship, there's a bunch of aliens going haywire and a bunch of little robots that are very cute, you know, running around like little RC cars. It's just chaos and sparks are flying and and you don't really know what's going on until John gets injected in the leg and, and all of a sudden everything makes sense. Like he can understand everything and these aliens are actually escaped convicts from a group called the Peacekeepers who are trying to take back the ship. And so the, these escaped convicts are a, a Luxon warrior named Caldargo. There is um, Domino Rigel, the... Is it 16th? 16th, I think, yeah. 16th. And we have Zan, and I honestly can't remember the, the type of alien she was. Delvian. 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 Okay, so so we have this original crew, and then we also have the pilot of the spaceship, which is just named Pilot, um, and his species is like bonded to the ship to help the ship navigate in space. But the ship, which is the living ship Moya, has a control collar on her, and the essentially the escapee crew and John Crichton are able to get the collar off and starburst. Whew, Come on, Kiki, that was funny. Juicy starburst, wetsuits. Off into the distance, which is kind of the setting for it. And essentially, our convicts are trying to escape, and John Crichton's trying to get home. And they're being chased by the peacekeepers, led by Bylar Crace, who's upset because John Crichton, quote-unquote, killed his brother whenever he uh, came into the galaxy and his brother ran into him. That's kind of the setting. We also have Aaron Soon, who is a, a peacekeeper who got irreversibly contaminated by being around John Crichton too long and is then kind of thrown into the uh, the criminal mix, if you will. And then we are essentially on a space chase across the the frontier, trying to find the the convict's way back home and being chased by Bylar Crace. So I think that kind of summarized the general plot. Yes, that was great. I don't want my show to get picked for next time because how am I going to follow that kind of summary? (laughs) (laughs) 
Well, again, you know, episodic from there with the overarching story of of being chased, right? What did you guys think of like kind of the the world? I guess because I can't. That's where we're we're kind of thrown into this universe very quickly, right? The world and the universe, great. Like I guess you said, uh, it's a Henson company. Like Rigel's awesome looking. Like I guess this is like where the practical effects really shines. Like in age, it's because he still looks good. I'm sure he looked like amazing back when the show was on the air. Mm-hmm. I, I think the makeup. All of that, the set design really hold up. The CG is a bit dated, right? That first episode, yeah. Moya looks rough. It gets yeah, better the, from there. The body paint, the time they must have spent in like costume and makeup would have been annoying to be on that show, probably. Jay? When when people talk about Farscape, they, they often throw around the word immersive. Mm. And I think that word is absolutely earned here. Mm. Uh, like... Like you said, the the sets, the production design, the the makeup, the puppets. Yeah, no puppet, no puppet. And- oh my lord! I got so much emotional connection with pilots. Who is this? Just fantastic, fantastic puppet. Clear. You know the puppet. I'm curious. Let's just talk about pilot for a second. Yeah. Like pilot is enormous, huge know? in size. Twice the size of a person, three times the size of a person. Uh, the few times that we we see somebody next right up him. next to him, he is enormous. And the detail on him with the the four arms and then those eyes, you know, those moments when Pilot is giving you a surprising piece of information and his eyes open up wide. Oh man! Yeah, like, all the puppets' eyes are like. Yeah. The the sequence awesome. when they are taking Pilot's arm is one of the toughest sequences to watch. Oh my gosh, yes. And like that whole episode is phenomenal. I think that that, that episode is one of the better episodes, in my opinion. Um, with the genetic map and with, you know, everything that happens to Aaron Sun. Like, I, I really think that episode is very, very well done. But it, it, it elicits a strong emotional response, right? There's a lot of moral... Qu- I feel like, in a lot of ways, things that people talk about, like Star Trek, are like the moral quandaries and moral questions that it proposes and stuff like that. And I feel like Farscape delivered those types of situations very well. Yeah. And the the, the example of taking Pilot's arm is is really perfect. Yeah. And that... I don't know about you, but my reaction in that moment was they can't possibly do this. And then they did it. And then they did it. What what about like the 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 uh the human reaction episode where Crichton goes through the fake wormhole and everyone comes along to Earth? And yeah. like from what what Crichton thinks would happen, the aliens mm-hmm. portray, you know, essentially Rigel being autopsied, right? When you yeah. saw Rigel on the autopsy table. Like I was, I and again I had seen the show and I knew that he survived and I was like, oh my god! <laughs> like it was, it was astonishing. I was, I guess I wasn't glad they did it, but like, yeah, that's what humans would do. We're pieces of shit. Like we would definitely <laughs> treat. Like we might not even let them land. We would probably just blow them out. Like we probably wouldn't even take any chance. We just immediately blow them out of the sky. No one would ever make it down. I don't know. You would hope that we'd be better than that, but no, the whole like autopsying and and all that stuff, I that that falls right into all of the sci-fi tropes of what the government would do, and and again, for for Crichton to think that way, like I felt like, I don't know, maybe he was thinking about movies, but it was I love the way he picked it apart, like it was all people he recognized, and that's where the facade started to fall apart. Like, like I liked the way they build these little situations. Like, it feels very believable from a sci-fi perspective. I don't know. I I liked a lot of these these episodic like situations they were found in, like with the the group of people who were addicted to the drug and it was it was they were mining their planet into non-existence. Mm-hmm. You know, like that uh, that whole like one and done episode was just such a a fun little foyer and then you immediately jump into something else. That's also a great example of how this show pieced together an episodic 
week by week story along with a larger arc because at the end of that episode we find out that they're farming the root for the peacekeepers yep so it it does a great job of having a nice a self-contained story while building the greater world and tying it into like what like they're like you say they're building the bigger world but they're also like letting you know how the peacekeepers are like affecting everything, right? Like they mm. are literally everywhere in this universe. And again, the fact that they look exactly like humans, I, I find that to be really interesting too. Yeah. I'm, I'm excited to find out in later seasons if, and if at all that's developed, if there is in fact, any connection between Sebations and humans, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm curious to know. Me too. I'm curious. Like, <laughs> Did anyone else have like a signs moment early on when she's overheating? And I'm like, okay, so we get all this uh, technology. We can travel through space at warp <laughs> speed. And these people know that their one weakness is hot temperatures. It's and they hot. have no yeah. countermeasures at all. They don't have suits that are like. They don't have a little tiny design. fan or anything. Yeah, no su- like special suits that they're like, we got to keep these on just in case we run into a situation where it gets hot somehow. Because it can happen. They just happen to know 80% of the universe is, like, cold. So, like, most of the time they're And all the planets have breathable atmospheres for (laughs) humans, even though humans aren't in this part of the universe. Well, just all carbon-based life forms apparently breathe the same thing. Probably so. Like... But anyway, like that really when she's overheating, I'm like, this, that really, like, that was one moment that stabbed me out. I'm like, uh... Ugh, it lost me. That, that week, one. that Achilles heel was too much for you. <laughs> not to da- not to ruin the show or anything, but I was just like, come on. I think it's a fair criticism. Like, yeah. I, I they, why not have just a suit? Like, it all you never saw the Sebations <laughs> in any type of bodysuit. Yeah, I don't know. They could have given the Peakskeepers a much better weakness. weakness. Yeah, yeah. I didn't even think about signs. That's funny. <laughs> So, um, I guess, anybody have a favorite character they'd like to share? Yes. Aaron Soon's voice is my favorite character. Aaron Soon's voice is your favorite. Is it her her Red Room voice or her normal English voice? The English voice. Oh, okay. <laughs> I did the, yeah, damn you Twin Peaks. I was like, they're just reversing <laughs> this, right? <laughs> But yeah, I was like, man, we got to get this lady's voice on stuff. And then I Google, I've, uh, IMD beat her, and she's like a lot of video game voice actress, voice actressing. And I'm like, okay, that's good because top notch, top notch voice. I yeah, she she got a great voice. Yeah, I'm reading she was matriarch Atheta in Mass Effect. Oh really? I'll have to tell Christy that she's in Destiny. She's a I think a main character in Uncharted is what I was seeing too. Strangely, uh, Crichton and Aaron Soon, their characters or their actors, um, take over the final two seasons of Stargate SG-1 as the main characters. Like, <laughs> like Farscape had ended and SG-1 <laughs> had basically lost all of its main characters. And so they just wrote these two new people into the show and it was those those two actors. Was that also a sci like a sci-fi network show? Yeah, it was they, sci-fi like, original Their series. contracts weren't up, so they had to do something. Maybe, but they, it was good. Like they enjoyed seeing them again. But it was funny because it was like billed as a reunion of the Farscape cast. Hey. <laughs> two of them. <laughs> okay, Jay, what about you? Who's your who's your favorite? Who's your Bobby? I ride for Rigel all okay. day long. <laughs> Rigel is such a shit. <laughs> like, you know, I, I, half the time I'm like... I love them helium farts, though. <laughs> I'm like, what the yachts are you doing, man? Uh, <laughs> but he's he's so selfish. He's so... But he's so predictable in that selfishness. You know, in the way that you you can't be mad at a snake for being a snake. 
you can't be mad at Rigel for being Rigel. He's going to sell you out if he has the opportunity to. But, uh, you know, I'm not saying he's a good person, but as a character, I loved it every time he showed up. <laughs> Honestly, uh, Caldago is one of my all time favorites. I, I, well, love, I, I, I love Caldago. Um, I think that he's an interesting character. He's the first one that kind of is, I think. You you are shown him as one way. He's a criminal. He's aggressive. He's violent. But then you kind of get more backstory to him, and I think he's really interesting. I feel like Zan also is really interesting. She's the opposite, though. Like she's this like very peaceful, very like calming. But then you kind of get more of her backstory, and she's got a a violent, murderous history. I feel like Rigel. We haven't got as much. Just that he was deposed, um, and and went, you know, suffered through some some torture. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I have to say, um, and I'm so glad I did not remember this, but Scorpius, uh, I think Scorpy. is, is one of the best bad guys in a sci-fi series. And I thought he started in season two when he showed up. I was like, Oh my God. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I loved him. Loved him. Loved him. Loved him. Loved how arch he was. I loved how he was always a step ahead. Mm-hmm. Great villain. Yeah. He wasn't dumb just to give the characters plot armor for no reason, which is like, I feel like a lot of times they make villains do stupid stuff. By like Crace. Like, right? Crace was yeah. a bad, bad guy. He wasn't, he was not that enthralling or even that scary. He just was a force chasing them. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and even his weird intimidation of killing his right hand woman, that seemed really odd. Right. I have been completely loyal to you and made sure no one knows about your treason. Kill you then. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the the peacekeepers would be a little bit scarier if their like society and command structure was a little bit more developed. Because mm-hmm. it seems so chaotic at this point. It seems like the, well, I think number one, we are on the frontier. We're not on the like probably the primary part of the military. This is more right. like exploration and frontiersmanship. So, I, I but I do agree with you. There seems to be way too much autonomy among the captains. Mm-hmm. Like, like Scorpion's just Scorpius is just running a base. Yeah, right. Yeah. He just has a base that he's doing whatever he wants. That man over there, he is an imposter. <laughs> Grab him. <laughs> I'm sorry. That was just a great moment, though. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have. I maybe I could be like missing stuff. Like, do they have their own planet, or are they all raised in like peacekeeper facilities and stuff? I there has not been a Sebacia mentioned, right? Yeah. Like we haven't gotten like a home world, but we have had reference to people being taken from their homes, which were conceivably plant planets. <laughs> are they so, like self sufficient? Because like at the beginning, it's like okay, the galaxy or the whatever universe is like they trust us to maintain order and stuff so i'm assuming they're getting like funding and support from all these plans where they become like autonomous and they're like the mafia and they like extort all the planets but you're exactly right either either they're just like hey instead of you having a standing military we'll just be your military and you pay us and if any like whoever and i guess as long as you're the government you pay them that that's fine but what happens whenever the the opposition pays them more? Yeah, I'm just like yeah, they don't have a yeah. I was just I was just curious on that. There was nothing ever. Jay, do you remember them ever discussing a home world? I don't remember that. No, I seem to remember either Aaron or Crace or maybe even Jelena. I don't remember some peacekeeper describing their life and describing how they've basically been on starships their entire lives. Yeah, I think that was Aaron. She's like, I heard you describing like trees and rivers and stuff but this is like all that i've ever seen it's like yeah hallways yeah remember she was eating the rain hi this is karen smith it's 68 degrees and there's a 30 percent chance that it's already raining Mm -hmm. (laughs) now rigel was my favorite but i think aaron was the most interesting character uh, because her her whole story of coming from not even knowing what the word compassion means to 
starting to learn a little bit of science to become something that she was not necessarily born or bred to be. I really enjoyed that whole theme of you don't have to be what other people say you are. Yeah, I like that too. I think that's a very good theme that that they did and explored with her. I I think all the character stories felt very unique and gave a lot of flavor and depth to them, you know. Mm-hmm. There is uh, and again, there there are some really funny quotes later. I hope that you continue watching cuz they're one of my favorite quotes from from is from Carl Doggo and it's just who, who I'm your daddy. And it's just like a <laughs> r- random situation where you know, Crichton sets it up for Card I'll not go to say that. And of course they went there, right? But <laughs> it just feels like, like, like Crichton is this unique being that has entered into the universe and is immediately disrupting things, right? Mm-hmm. And I really like that aspect. Like it feels very human to go somewhere and just f- fuck shit up by accident. <laughs> I feel like Dargo never was. He wasn't as big as a badass as I wanted him to be. Like, he was never dominating people that hard in, like, fights, I felt like. I was like, oh, this dude's going to mess people up. And, like, he was getting his ass kicked a lot by people of similar size. I thought he was going to be, like, a super crazy warrior. Like, if it was, if it ever came down to, like, hand-to-hand or close-quarters combat, it would be, like, no competition. And his sword hardly ever did any, anything. Like, his, this gun part of his sword did stuff, but... It was like his sword wasn't doing much. Well, but he, they kind of talked about how that that was a vestige of a, you know, time whenever their technology failed and they had to resort to rudimentary weapons, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So I mean, there is a, a little bit of a dis- discussion that that's more symbolic, right? I, I hear you. I think that there's more to to unfold, but I will also say we didn't have any like outside of. There was a couple of times that, like, on they fought, but I don't feel like there were any like real big epic battles, right? Many times they fought, they're like in the hallway of Moya, or they're like. Yeah. I just feel like he's getting knocked down and knocked out by people that are. I'm like, he, this is a big dude, and he's jacked. <laughs> you can see his deep V the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> he has to have the like the hardest makeup too of everyone. I th- his looks like just like a bodysuit. Like put this bodysuit on, and then uh, we'll put th- something on your nose, the face, like the eyebrows and stuff. That looks like it'd take a while, but I feel like you have to like yeah. put all that stuff on. Yeah, you have to like glue it all to his eyebrows to keep it moving right. Yeah, that face is going to be hours of makeup every day. Same with Zan. She's mm-hmm. she's going to be painted blue. And Chiana, she's to get painted. What did you guys think of Chiana? I wasn't particularly. Didn't like her that much. It just felt like it was an element of chaos added in. Yeah, we we didn't quite get enough of her yet to to really know, but she felt a little too reminiscent of the villain from an earlier episode, the time loop one. Yeah. With yeah. the old scientist and the, the crazy eyes lady. Like she felt a little too much like crazy eyes lady. I mean, who's putting these little in the script, uh, do head tilts and creepy smirks like, <laughs> while you say your lines and do it like change your head tilt direction every time you uh, finish a sentence. Like <laughs> Maybe that was just her interpretation of the character. The yeah. male version did not do any of those type of head tilts. If you remember, that was the one with Rigel's tormentor. Mm, yeah. I, I will say whenever Crichton <clears throat> is in the chair, his his just absolute tormenting was very convincing. Yes. That's kind of a theme on this show. The <laughs> it, it, it's it's dark, but I I was a little critical of Ben Browder's performance as Crichton for most of the show because he's such a doofus. Mm-hmm. Read my lips. We just started a wormhole. But the last couple episodes when he's in the Aurora chair in the, in the clip show device and, and Crichton is you know, holding back this part of his mind as hard as that he can and just being absolutely destroyed mentally for it. His, his screaming and his pain was really, really effective. 
See, I always took Ben Browder's performances, Crichton, as a form of, like, self-defense mechanism, right? Like, I, me and Chrissy talked about this a lot. Like, the, he would make pop culture references to a bunch of people who never would understand what he's talking about, right? In fact, there were times whenever, like, Aaron or Caldago said, what? Like, like didn't understand what he was saying. Mm-hmm. I I took that as kind of like trying to bring sanity to himself. Like, mm-hmm. you know, if if I'm referencing things that I recognize, it brings some normalcy to my situation. Even if no one else gets it, and even if no one else understands it, I, I'm able to kind of frame it up in a way that I can appreciate it. And so to me, I, I kind of watched, because again, right at the beginning, the existential crisis that he would have to go through recognizing where he is in the, you know, in the universe and the likelihood of ever getting home. Like that's pretty, that's pretty mind boggling. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I always took his attitude as this is the only way that I can prevent myself from going crazy, you know, is kind of making jokes and poking fun at it and trying to figure out if there's a way to get home. So I don't know if if no one else saw it that way. That's just how I saw it. You know, I couldn't the wormhole one where he finds one. Like I couldn't believe it's only been seven months. Yeah, I was like seven months. What? So like, wow, they have an action packed life. <laughs> I w- I always assuming like months or weeks between each like event in my little head cannon. I'm like seven months. Dang. And they showed us the dentist bug, but where's like the bug that cuts your hair to look exactly the same for seven months on a spaceship. That's the DRD. <laughs> they do not that droids. DRDs. DRDs. Yeah. Yeah. So Jay, you thought that that was a reasonable interpretation of, of Crichton's attitude. Yeah, I, I do. I had, I had a lot of trouble figuring Crichton out because the pilot episode makes it very clear that he is a scientist. I'm a damn scientist. Yeah, yeah he is, is an astronaut and a pilot, but the the theories ca- came up by him and his brother Armand from White Lotus. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, they're they're science guys. Yeah, but Crichton's personality, once we really get to know him, seems a lot more like high school quarterback. Not that there aren't any astronauts and, and science geeks who were who weren't also high school quarterbacks, but it's. It was kind of hard to to fit him into a trope, I guess. I don't disagree. I I, I think that that's a fair assessment that his his personality is one part, I, it, in a very silly way, one part outlaw, one part like you know Texas quarterback, one part you know nerd, and you know one part astronaut. So I it, it's 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 weird because I felt like the way he was acting was to preserve his mind, right? Like it, Mm -hmm. you you could just say he's just chiddly written, but if we're going to be Twins Peaks fans, then we're going to have to take what we have and interpret it. So I, I feel like there's a good way to look at this, that, that Crichton is this has found himself in this weird outlaw situation, right? He's, he's on the run disoriented in a different galaxy and, you know, just, just trying to survive is quite challenging in and of itself so far from home. <laughs> so, you know, any companionship he has is with aliens who don't understand him, his way of thinking, the way he, why he does what he does. Right. And that's constantly, they certainly understand how to get it in though. Yeah. Apparently all the, the, all the, <laughs> the, the pipe and tubes and all that work the same, but no, nope, but they're constantly talking about how that, that Oh, but that's Crichton. You know, he's so weird. Right. Like the, everybody, there's even like Aaron Sun, Zan, they all kind of talk in this dismissive way about Crichton when it comes to certain aspects of his thinking, personality, concerns, right? Yeah, it's almost like, ah, that's the new guy. Yeah, he doesn't know what's going on. Just ignore that guy. He definitely had a lot of Captain Kirk in him. He also, it's not sci-fi, but he also had some Jared Kiso in him. In that every lady who comes into contact with John Crichton Mm -hmm. is going to want to spend some time with some John Crichton. You're not wrong. Pretty much. You're not wrong. And apparently no jealousy at all out there. Yeah. (laughs) They're very evolved. 
it's not the future, but it is a different galaxy, maybe? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Just traveling in the wormhole, that should time should have traveled there, right? Yeah. Like that's what I've been talking about this whole time. I noticed that. That's what I didn't buy about the the premise is that it's like oh, traveling millions bi- billions of light years to another galaxy um, took eleven minutes. Good <laughs> time. Sorry. Good time. So that's what that's what you didn't buy about the premise. <laughs> Well, you know what I mean? Like, okay, number one, I've been doing a lot of research on wormholes and black holes yeah. because I randomly saw a video that I was like, that has to be bullshit, but it actually has some scientific backing to it. Um, there is a black hole theory called black hole cosmology that essentially black holes in our galaxy are creating more universes and that we are, in fact, inside of a black hole because the um, Schwarzschild radius of a black hole that would contain all the matter in our universe would be the about the exact size of what we consider the visible universe. So essentially, as far as we can see, if we took all of that and we measured that distance as far as we can, and we take all the visible matter that we can see, and we did a calculation to what a Schwarzschild radius for that amount of matter is, that's it's equal to that visible distance. So the theory is we're actually inside of a black hole of a collapsed star from an upper universe and then all the black holes in our universe are then essentially creating new lower universes and so a black hole is a singularity on one end there would be a a wormhole which is the einstein rosen bridge which would then lead to a white hole which is where the matter or or (laughs) data would come out i'm not even kidding these are the actual terms and so so what Crichton comes out of would be the white hole and the tube that connects them is the wormhole I'm sorry for being so mature. It is fine, but this is all the actual terminology because I had to do. A, I, I just researched all this stuff. But anyways, I've I've never heard that before. That's that's very interesting. So yeah, it's called black hole cosmology. It's a theory that was proposed in the '90s. There's there's some math to back it. There's a lot of problems with it, but it's an interesting theory. That makes me think of those Tool album covers where there's like the guys eating each other, and yeah. it's just like a guy eating each. You know what I mean? Well, it's just like levels. Yeah. Levels. What are you doing? Levels. <laughs> Levels. Yeah, I'm getting rid of all my furniture. So anyways, that's that's what I learned about wormholes and black holes and all those holes. So, um, but... It's, it's, it's funny you say that because I actually, I, I started listening to a podcast about Farscape. I, would, I got so into this show. Oh, interesting. And... It's uh, I think it's just called Farscape Rewatch. It's done by two guys who I think are Dutch, uh, but they're both science guys. And that's not really what the show is about. But the in the episode, the time loop one, where the bad guys have a, quote, piece of a wormhole on their ship. Mm. Uh, these, these two guys just lost it because they were like, that's not how that works. That's not how like, that works. If, you, if, if somehow you were able to divide a, a black hole in half, which you can't, but even if you could, you wouldn't have two halves of a black hole. You would have two black holes. You'd have, yeah, two, because it's, it's just a dense mass. And again, the mass is going to form based off of the warping of the gravity. So yeah, you, it would just shape into another round sphere. Yeah. No, that's, it's funny. But this, this is a show that I think Roman from Party Down would call soft sci-fi. Yeah, I where, agree. You know, it doesn't really matter. It's a fun-ass show. Well, I will say, though, I do like the microbes that translate everything. I like that better than 99% of all explanations for why aliens speak English in any sci-fi. Okay, so why is it better? What, what, is, what is the alternative? Like, you have, oh, we have, a, we have a computer that's just translating everything for everyone. Like, at least yeah. this makes sense. Like, if there's, oh, we have a, a colony of microbes in your brain that are, are taking the information and translating it for you. That at least, like, is some explanation as to why Crichton, a language that no one's going to fucking know, you know, immediately, like, everyone's <laughs> like, oh, like, your ship, can we get this, you know, get here with it? Right? Like, it just, to me, makes sense. Whereas if you had an alien or, like, a, a computer that had to translate, so to speak, it would be like, oh, well, we don't, we, you'd have to listen to you talk now. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. I liked it. I thought it was an interesting way of explaining it. I've never heard wh- how, why, why do Romulans speak English? Jay, could you explain that one to me? 
uh, the the Federation has a universal translator. It's a computer that that translates for you. It's it's exactly what you're talking about. I think I'd prefer a translator. They could do the same. They could have used like I guess nano machines wasn't really like a thing. Probably back in the '90s, the people were like sci-fiing out. But I wish it was more like nano machine, like AI that did the same thing, goes to the base of your brainstem or something, and then like, auto translates it. Because like it's the, I mean you can't think too much about it, but like. When he first episode, he's like talking about wormholes. Are like, okay, we don't know what that is. Like a worm thingy you're talking about, which like makes sense. Like they probably don't even have worms, so they don't know what a worm or like they don't know what a wormhole. Is. You know what I mean? We know like, what holes are. But what's a worm? <laughs> like you know, like this isn't you got to think of like an earth worm, and it makes a little tube shaped hole. Like and it's a wormhole, and it makes sense to us. But like, okay, they wouldn't have any idea. But then like most like not all idioms, but a lot of idioms and phrases and. Figures of speech get like auto translated with earth words, which is like there's probably not an earth word in this other language. So even if they could, these microbes could like translate intention, it'd still be like half the things they say would be like. We do have failures of the translators. You're right. Like there's one time that even like um, Dargo says something. And it doesn't fully translate, right? Like he says, it's like it's like a youth doing blaga blaga, and I was like, oh, that didn't translate. I have no idea what that is, but it's like clearly referencing from the context, you know, like some type of immature act or doing something like that. So I I think that I like that kind of stuff. I felt like that made it more immersive, and also made it to where it wasn't just Crichton constantly making movie quotes that they didn't understand. <laughs> like there was other failures of the translation between different cultures how can you uh and how is the where's the switch to manually make it to where people can't understand you yeah. especially with dargo he, a couple times he does he does his native language and even uh Z- zan too they do their native language like intentionally and then all of a sudden like no one can like, you can't understand it unless you're like everybody else but john and they can still understand it because i guess they know the language but like how do you manually activate it not translating. That's a fair question. I thought that Zan said that it was something that wouldn't translate into Crichton's tongue, but I, I didn't pay mm. close enough attention to what she said. Maybe so. All the other species seem to understand it. Well, but we don't know how long these other species have interacted, you know? Like, like when did the DRD, like, translator microbes come into play? Episode one. Oh, you mean like in the universe? Yeah, not not yeah. canonically. Well, everyone gets them at birth. Apparently. But there had to be a point where those were invented. Yeah, that's true. Also, at that point where it breaks down, is like, why have language at all? Why not just be like, I'm going to make intention towards just any noise, right? Yeah. What if something doesn't have a mouth or hear, like the ability to hear sound? Is that what the microbes are? Are we like expelling microbes through our mouth and they're going into the other creature's body and then the other microbes in their brain stems or whatever thinking organ they have is translating that? Or is it Maybe. sound waves? Is it sound waves or is it like biological little microbes spilling out? I think that if you're assuming they don't have a mouth or ability to hear, then I'm going to also argue they probably don't have a brain stem. So that might be a moot point, but you know, what about I think those ant that, things? I, again, not everything was able to communicate. Like you know, a lot of stuff was right. Like like very early on, there was an episode where the ship was being taken over by a like a formless being, which is a, a you know classic sci fi premise. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they, I, I seem to remember that the three dimensional one. The bug one Man, where sure. it got too hot for Aaron. Oh, well, I, I remember that they they had to take over somebody's body and speak through them, and I think it was Zan, if I remember right. Yeah, they scorpion stinged her in the it, <laughs> clavicle. Yeah, that one has a that one has a very Mass Effect homage to it, or really, oh, Mass Effect homage is Farscape. There, there's an entire storyline that just mirrors that episode completely. Oh, nice. Yeah, but I remember that. But that that then gets back to that species had another way to try and communicate, right? Mm-hmm. Like it spoke through some type of weird high vibrations and then had to find a way to communicate with everything else. They are say our boy John is uh, super strong. 
when he pulled yeah. himself back in from like the venting into space with just that little spear thing. He like pulled himself back to the door. I was like, damn boy, superhuman strength. Vacuum of space means nothing. Uh, it's clearly the the food cubes. You know, they've got all the nutrition <laughs> the growing boy needs. And what type? Like, I was looking for some like. Uh, I guess it wouldn't be called glass, but I was like, they went out onto the terrace and it straight up looked, I was like, maybe it was him and Aaron, like, it was called the terrace, it was right at the beginning of the show, and I don't know if I ever saw it again, but it was like, it's like, looked like a patio in space on top of the ship. I was like, how is this working? There was an observation deck where you could look at space, I remember that episode. Yeah, I didn't see like any sort of framing around this deck, it just looked like a deck. I'm just I do remember what you're on random. About. I'm just poking, just stabbing out. Well, I like the show. Jay, what did you think of? I'm not trying to single Jay out. Just I'm curious as a Star Trek fan, what did you think of the living ship? Very interesting. Very, very interesting twist. Uh, especially how they they had pilot as the intermediary, mm-hmm. be the voice who could. Yeah, be the voice for the ship, communicate with it, and at times, you know, it was almost like a, it was almost like having a partner in your life, Mm -hmm. where, you know, sometimes he could speak directly to it, other times he had to just kind of infer based on, off of context and emotion, you know, that, that felt really, really unique to this show, Mm -hmm. because it's, it's inescapable to to compare this show to, to Star Trek and especially specifically to Star Trek Voyager, because they both have very similar premises and aired at the same time. But, uh, and, and to talk about the, you know, the, 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 the biomechanoid of it, uh, Star Trek Voyager also has an element of that where when they introduce the ship, they make a big deal about how the ship has these, these bio gel packs that somehow make it think faster, but it's, it, it's nowhere approaches having the ship have a personality, which we see here with, with Moya, mm-hmm. where in, in all the Star Trek shows, there's a huge part of the Star Trek fandom that is just like, you know, stroking yourself, looking at the ship and be like, Oh man, look at that ship. It's so <laughs> good. You know, like, like guys with like world war two ships, mm-hmm. but uh, Farscape takes it in, a, in such a different direction where the ship is a character mm-hmm. and you have to you have to care for it and you have to nurture it and you have a relationship with it. Well, and, and again, it becomes pregnant, right? Mm-hmm. And, and gives birth to Talon, which is apparently a warship. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I definitely setting up for some future interesting storylines, but... I, I don't know. To me, yeah. Interesting, creative, unique. I, I also liked that it, like Moya had fears. She was afraid that the crew was going to leave her, right? Yes. That kind of stuff really, like, it made their journey together feel more vibrant. You know, like it was more, mm-hmm. like, the ship is not just a tool. It's a, it's a piece of the crew. It's It's a part of the team. Yeah. So, I like that a lot as well. Have have both of you guys seen Battlestar Galactica? No, I don't think I've seen any Battlestar. Okay, I'm not going to get into that, but it's basically like sci-fi during during the Bush era, also, but more serious sci-fi. Um, I just I just find it interesting because this is also same time period, right? This mm-hmm. this this season's before 9/11, right? So that's that's different. But if Crichton came back, he'd come back because it what four years, four seasons. He would be coming back into a post nine eleven world, and they would definitely be dissecting those aliens then. Yeah, I I got really strong like Guantanamo vibes from that, and it was it was kind of funny given that it, it was from nineteen ninety nine, uh, from from before Guantanamo really became what it is. <laughs> We've always been this way. We just didn't do it that out loud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The funny thing is, is the world has all the, the, the stories about the CIA, just like the KGB. We just have the stories about the KGB. <laughs> well, well, Aaron, this is not your first time watching this. So on a, on a rewatch, any, any thoughts on, on differences the second or third or fourth time around? Thoroughly enjoyed it. There are absolutely some plot holes. The fact that things did not air uh, uniformly 
across the world was interesting. Did not know that. Although it, it doesn't matter up to a certain point because I think it's all episodic, like you said, really self-contained until you get to a certain point. And then the last like mm-hmm. six episodes are really, you kind of have to do right in a row. But at the end, I want to point out a couple of things. Stark. Golden phase. This makes it personal. Is an odd character that's added in during the Scorpius base story. He is not consistently anywhere from that moment on. Like, I don't know, like, he's escaping with them, but he's not in the scenes where it's Aaron and the other peacekeeper and John, mm-hmm. all, all of the escaping sections. But then when they all meet up at the top with Caldago and Zan, there Stark is. Well, they you know? do split up. Like, uh, they're trying to go up the staircase, and he gets in, and then, like, they... Like Aaron and John and Jelena have to go down and hide in that little, uh, whatever. Okay, I guess I, I missed that part. I just felt like he just disappeared. He just also was gone, and then he was back, and then it continued on the ship in the episodes after. There were moments where he was a part of everything that was going on, and then all of a sudden he just seemed to not be a part of the crew anymore. Like I don't think in the last episode he's he's shown once. Yeah, and everyone's like talking and saying goodbye, and he's like nowhere to be found. And so I just was saying that that character is weird at the end. It doesn't seem to really follow correctly the pattern of of the story. But I think he's an interesting character. I also like Paul Goddard just generally. So um, he's got to come back because when I IMDb it, it said he was in like 35 episodes or something like that. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. He does. And he's going to be continuing on. But I will say I think the story holds up. I definitely think that Crace is not a great bad guy, and I think that Scorpius is phenomenal, and I'm so glad that he is in season one. Um, I felt like there were some some specific homages to Star Trek when watching back through it this time, kind of like there was the figure that that brings Crace and Crichton together in this like nether world. I felt like that was very Q kind of inspired or whatever. Oh yeah. Um, oh yeah. And so I felt like that whole episode, I was sitting there saying, I know that Jay has to be thinking that this reminds him of Q. So, um, and were there any other things that you thought that were homages to Star Trek? There there were a lot of very, very similar premises in the episodes, but it's, it's really not even that they were similar to Star Trek. It's just that it was, it it was just sci-fi episodes. Just classic sci-fi tropes. Yeah, like the uh, the ship's being taken over by little beings, and we have to not necessarily fight them, but we have to empathize with them and understand them. Or you know, I'm I'm stuck in a time loop. That that sort of thing. Uh, there was, you know, they say that uh, as the great Noel Gallagher came up with. What is it? Good artists. Oh God, are, are, you, are you talking up? about good artists create, great artists steal? Yes. Let's, pop, let's Pablo <laughs> Picasso. <laughs> well, they you do know. directly reference. Star I think that Noel guy stole they? that from Pablo. <laughs> oh. Sorry, they do reference Star Trek directly because uh, when him and Dargo are about to go on that suicide mission, he calls himself Spock and Kirk. Okay, so it's at least yeah, Star Trek's in the universe. So again, I think we'll see more references to to pop culture as the show continues on. For me, it held up in my memory. Like, all the things that I liked about it, all the things... Again, I don't think it's a perfect show. I definitely think that it's it's got some issues. But for a unique and interesting sci-fi show, I think it holds up. I think that it, it delivers what it's trying to offer. Yeah, I'm, I'm very excited to watch more of it. And it's it's been a little difficult to, to read about this show without spoiling what happens later you know like like tony said you look up the actor and then you see that he's in 30 more episodes yep. and you said well pff, he's not dying in this one that was <laughs> <laughs> that's true and i kind of did that to myself with jelena where i was like man i really like her i, I wonder if she comes back and then you see how many she's in and you go oh yeah. okay i can kind of <laughs> i can kind of see where this is going they did her dirty they did her girl dirty but i was telling jay i know why they had to do it because she was hotter than aaron so they had to get rid of her so your team Jolino over Aaron? <laughs> yeah, I mean, for the first season, I didn't really feel like there wasn't enough 
for me, I guess there was, but it's like there wasn't a lot of like spark. Yeah, or like develop like it's like all the development was behind the scenes. Like, oh, they're just like saying, "Oh, I care about you." Where I like never really saw that they cared about each other, but they're just like it happened. I feel like there was probably too much discussion about this in the writers' room, and and it it must have been like a, a debate. And they had to offer something else and then take it away. Like, I feel yeah. like this, I, I completely agree with you. Like at the beginning, it's Aaron sounds just so standoffish. There's not really any time that they're cooling off. And then whenever they go to earth and she's like, not even sebations would be this bad to people. Yeah. You know, <laughs> like, where's the point where it's like, you know what? John Crichton's okay. Yeah. I mean, obviously, it was way too fast, like, half an episode to fall in love and basically stay faithful for seven months until you rescue him and uh, die for him. But, yeah, that was Team Juliana. I think from Juliana, I wanted more motivation behind her decision to leave the peacekeepers. Yeah. Like, I guess yeah, was I, I wanted a little more, like, hey, these people are fascists and I don't want to do their bidding anymore. Or maybe even a little more of... Like they they have my family, and if I leave, that they'll kill them all. Like, yeah, she was like too good of a character to be like still maintaining this Aurora chair <laughs> torture mm-hmm. device. Like, I, I don't know, I don't know who is getting tortured in the chair. Maybe you could have been sabotaging it or holding up the development a little bit on your end. Well, she had enough wherewithal to be able to program in a safe spot for Crichton, so <laughs> and a fake memory. Yeah. Like, dang, girl, work for LucasArts or whatever, doing CG for Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> we don't even know if they have movies in this universe. That is true. They do. You know, I like this Earth that has uh, unlimited uh, tape recording tape. <laughs> <laughs> so is he not just taping over the same tape over and over again? Is he? I mean, he could, but then what's the point of? It's like, well, thank, <laughs> those thank earlier God, messages. Thank God I brought. Thank God I brought two years worth of <laughs> dictation tape in this six like hour flight. I mean, yeah. yeah. Like, where where is that going? I, again, I I, I I chalk that up to like mental stability, right? Like, <laughs> that's like diary. You know, I, <laughs> I did call this show immersive, but the. The very beginning, the like five minute sequence where Crichton is on Earth and then launching into his spaceship Mm -hmm. is some of the lowest budget television I think I've ever seen. I completely agree. It's Mm -hmm. it's it's pretty like (laughs) taped together. (laughs) Like they're doing the scene where where the astronauts walking down the hallway, getting prepped for the mission with the scientists walking behind him. And he's not even in like a spacesuit. He's in like a an orange pullover. Mm-hmm. And then he gets into the ship and there's no breathing apparatus around his head. He's just got like sunglasses on. <laughs> they just like built the oxygen into yeah. the ship. <laughs> yeah. I do I will say, you know, like humans do. I wish that I had watched the show when it came out. And if nothing else, just for reference of like what existed and what didn't exist. Like, what is, like, referencing Farscape and what is Farscape referencing? I don't really have a good, like, mental point in my head to be like, oh, this is, like, why these movies or these shows have this is because it was on Farscape. Or this is why Farscape had this. Cause, like, it's, like, floating in a time period. And also, like, my – I got to admit, like, the first, like, two, uh, two or three episodes, I was like, how did they – I mean, the show is awesome. I already said the puppets and like the world building. It was like, how did the show get enough budget for these puppets and the CG and all the locations? Like, obviously, they're trying hard, like all the props and the set design. I'm like, w- the writing in this show is like, it's good, but it's like a teenager, like <laughs> a really good teenager wrote it because like everyone's just like horny as fuck and like. Every time John talks to somebody, he's like leaning on a wall, leaned over, like flexing his muscles, and he, or he has a conversation with people. Like they fall on the ground, and he stays laying on top of them while they talk. And like, what? <laughs> I'm like, where did like? Obviously, it gets like better and better, and the world is awesome, and the characters and everything. I'm just like, how did it get? Like, how did they get the budget for this whole 22 hour long season? Like, it was like, I was impressed. I was impressed, but I was like, man, this is kind of like teenagery. 
Although that's a bad thing, but see here. The series was originally conceived in the 90s by Rockney and Brian uh, under the name Space Chase. So oh, they, oh, they I guess, started developing it. If I remember, I thought that this is this is after Jim Henson had passed away and his son had taken over the company. So maybe, I don't know, maybe he put some money behind it and and funded the, the pilot and the original and got it picked up by Sci-Fi. But I want to say this. It is almost a a trope in and of itself for a show to be canceled by the Sci-Fi Channel because of budget issues, because that's what happened to The Expanse. That's what happened to Stargate SG-1, Atlantis, and Universe. That's what happened to no SG-1 finished Atlantis and Universe got canceled, and and that's what's happened happened to this one. It, it's funny because it seems like Sci-Fi Channel would just like green light these very expensive shows thinking they're going to make the money back from broadcast. And then after four or five years, they realize, Oh, we're not cancel it all. <laughs> so <laughs> it may also just be that sci-fi channels executives were not good at business. And that is why <laughs> some of these shows got made. Well, thank goodness really they weren't. Budgets. Yeah, I know. I'm all. I'm thankful the Sci Fi Channel went under because we got a lot of good shows out of that era. <laughs> it's almost like, in entertainment terms, making a Sci Fi show or maybe even launching a Sci Fi network is the highest risk, lowest reward possible. Yeah, Where because nothing inherently exists. like that's why it's Sci Fi. Yeah. The, the budget is going to have to be big because you're going to have to paint up Dargo every day. Yep. You're going to have to build the ship and do the CGI and build the puppet mm-hmm. and all that. And then your pool of, of people who are going to watch it is admittedly Small. smaller than some other genres. While across the street, you've got the Bravo company where... They just film can you imagine? people walking around talking. Yeah, can you imagine how cheap it is to film a season of Below Deck where they just rent a yacht, have some some cameras fill some rich people do some shit, and then, you know, they even charge the people to stay on the boat. So it's not even like the, the network is paying for the boat to begin with. And your your audience is, you know, basically every woman I've ever met. So, <laughs> you universal. Know, m- maybe... Yeah, like you said, we're we're lucky uh, that we we did have these shows produced for sure. I mean, again, think about was it the that um, the Rings of Power show, right? The Lord of the Rings one. Did you, yeah, did, billion dollars, did right? You, yeah, billion dollars. Did you see what the data was on people who finished the show? Oh no, only thirty seven percent of people who started the show finished the show. I What's didn't even it? I didn't even finish the first episode. <laughs> I didn't even start the show. <laughs> You guys are getting paid? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they had hobbits that I didn't care about. I'm like, I don't care about I, these random I, hobbits. Like, I, I'm sh- I don't know how they big or small their role in the overall plot was, but I'm like, I don't care. Are you saying 37% is a high percentage to finish the That's show? That's what Jake? I'm thinking. Yeah. <laughs> That's higher than I thought it was going to be. Did you finish I thought, the show? I thought it was going to be single digits. No. You, so did you start it? I watched the first episode, okay. but I mean, a little bit c- further than get me. into it. Yeah. Adam definitely was like, "It's one of my favorite fantasy shows I've ever seen." I did hear it got better, but I got better. <laughs> I'm I'm feeling much better now. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, how are you gonna I, have Galadriel? I mean, how are you gonna top Kate Blanchett? How are you gonna have Elrond? And how are you gonna top Hugo Weaving? Like that's asking for a disaster. But that also assumes that you need to top in order to tell a story, and I don't think that you always have to. Like, you don't always have to have something that's bigger and better if it's something that connects a story. But again, I'm also someone who is totally cool with story-driven content. So, like, if I... Like, for example, I think that... um, What is it? Rogue One, like, is one of the great pieces of storytelling that ties a big part of the story together, and it was executed phenomenally... I, I don't think it's necessarily bigger than, you know, a lot of the other movies, but I think that it tells a story very well and in a way that is very enthralling and it's worth watching. Right. So I, I don't know. To me, I, I like stories and I feel like 
there's nothing wrong with kind of filling in the gaps. And and so again, I I would watch it. I just hadn't had time. I've been watching all the show show stuff. <laughs> oh, there's only so many hours in the day. It's what, it was. I again, I did feel that I did say that <laughs> that that I was like, oh, <laughs> yeah, this is like yeah. hour long episodes, and there's twenty of them. So that's just a different time. Like, do hour long shows even get made anymore? Really, that aren't HBO. Yes, believe it or not, I, I had to spend some time in an emergency room with a family member recently and was subjected to, I think, about four hours worth of Blue Buds that, uh, oh, God, the Magnum P.I. show where he's a he's like the police commissioner in New York. I like, know exactly what you're I talking thought, about. I thought that show was dead and buried. It's still on. Really? It's still on. Wow. Yeah. And they still make NCIS. And the guy from Office Space, the boss from Office Space, is like the main agent now. That's wild. Yeah. The, 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 can, I'm going to need you to come in on Saturday. That guy? Yeah, Lumberg. <laughs> he's, the, he's the main agent on NCIS now. He's, he's solving all the world's problems one staple at a time. <laughs> at least the Navy is, I guess. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, there's there's some shit being made. Out I watched. <laughs> see, I have this theory, and I, I call it the um, the the, the white hole theory. Oh, no, sorry. the the T Rex <laughs> paradox. <laughs> I'm sorry, T Rex paradox. <laughs> yeah. So, anyways, I, I I guess white hole is really funny, but it's just actual scientific term. <laughs> sorry, I just like saw an opportunity went for it. I do want to hear um, it though. I'm sorry. No, it's 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 fine. So Led Zeppelin released um, "Stairway to Heaven" the same year that T Rex released the song "Bang a Gong," and I don't know if you've ever listened to the song "Bang a Gong," but it's an absolute shitter. Um, and so there's always going to be amazing, great content and absolutely awful content that is released any time period, right? So you're going to get really great stuff now, and you're going to get really awful stuff now. And so I, I, I feel like I use this example to say that there's no like real golden ages, right? There's always going to be people making good stuff and there's always going to be people making garbage. So you just got to dig through all the garbage to find the diamonds. Dig yourself out of the shit. Twenty nine ninety nine. Unless they put it on the radio and play it all the time. That's why you have this. That's why you have the show show. It's true. To tell you if it's a diamond or if it's garbage. <laughs> you know, that that's kind of. In a in an alternate universe, maybe if I slip through a wormhole and start a podcast on that side, I w- would imagine the show show being in search of those diamonds in the rough. Mm-hmm. And I think Farscape is a hundred percent one of them. I agree. No, I, I think Farscape fits the bill of being one of those shows that very few people watched or know about, and it's underrated as hell. Yeah, forgotten classics. Mm-hmm. True. Yeah, I just knew the. I've heard the name, but if you asked me what it was was or what it was about, I wouldn't be able to tell you before watching the show. The fans of Farscape are not as bad as the fans of The Wire when it comes to that. But I, I feel like The Wire is another one of those shows that, like, if you've seen it, you know how great it is, and if you don't, you just don't even know what you're missing. It is true. It's also a meme, but it is also true. It's a meme. You're absolutely yeah. right. It's a hundred percent a meme, but the meme there's some truth to it, right? Yeah. If nothing else, season one. Yeah. If nothing else, season one. But yeah. again, the entire th- orchestration of it is really well done. So, are we are we ready to score this? And again, what what are we scoring it as? Like, is it is it DRDs? Is it Frells? Is it? <laughs> it's a white hole. Is it white holes? Sure, let's go with white holes. I'm sorry, I don't know why that's so funny. <laughs> I'm just still generally laughing at that. Yeah. Um, gosh, I need to grow up. <laughs> I'm good with starbursts. I'm good with any of that. Somebody, somebody give me a number here. Oh, I'll go. I'm going to go with a seven. I thought it was pretty great, but I do wish I had, like, the. I wish I had experienced it when it, like, first existed or, like, right around the time it was first coming out. Mm. I'm I'm going to go with eight. My my reasoning is this. I think the show is solid. I think it's a, it's a recommend, a high recommend. I think it delivers on all the places that it needs to. I completely agree. It's got some holes. It's got some white holes and black holes. It's got some wormholes. But it, at the end of the day, I think it delivers 100% what it's offering. And the, you know, the ability to look past the, um, 
the, um, you know, strings and puppetry and things that kind of look dated, such as Moya in the first episode. I, I think that you obviously have to suspend some level of, of realism and, and accept the universe, but... I th- I think that even with the things we've pointed out, the immersion is pretty impressive, and and for that, even if you were to show this to someone like you know a kid who's who's getting into sci-fi, I think that it's something that they could enjoy and get into, and it not be considered to be dated or you know too old. So, all right, eight from Aaron. For me, I think I'm going to come in at six and a half. For for potential, I think this is 10 out of 10. I think that the characters are great. The world building is great. A lot of the combinations between the individual characters, especially like uh, the relationship that's built between Aaron and Pilot is really great. I think the the premise could use a little work in that having them being on the run... It, it's like that works for a movie, but for a 22 episode run, it, I felt like they needed a little bit more of why all of these characters continue to stay on the ship together. Great show to anybody who likes sci-fi. I would absolutely recommend. And I am a hundred percent going to be watching uh, to the end of this series. I'm very excited to see how it comes out. Very good. Got a, a seven, a 6.5 and an eight. Let me do some quick math. Beep, boop, beep. <laughs> I've got a composite score of 7.16 repeating. Nice. I mean, it is imp- it's impressive. Like, if you ask me what the quality I thought would be for, like, a 1999 sci-fi show and the premise, that it's way better than you'd think it'd be. I think there's some people who don't like practical effects or don't appreciate them as much, and they won't maybe enjoy the show and maybe that's one of the barriers to entry a lot of people look at it and are like meh but i don't know how you can look at that or look at yoda and and be like meh because i feel like they put their heart and soul into the makeup uh in this show Mm -hmm. and i think that it comes off as like an authentic immersion experience from the very get-go at least on the ship i feel you're thrown kind of into this world very quickly and it and the world has to make sense to some degree yeah i felt like the crews that was working on this show were like it was a labor of love, like building the sets and the costumes and everything. It was like these people were probably not getting paid enough to make these things. Like they were probably using their free time, not getting paid to make these things happen. It's kind of the feeling I got because it was like it felt like they tried super duper hard. Well, a composite score of seven point one six repeating. And that puts it just right about in the middle of our master ranking, just above season one of Avenue Five, just below season one of AP Vio. Very good. Well, are we ready to head into the the uh, wheel of randomonium? Oh. Let's do it. All righty, start sharing. So this month. On the wheel. I will be bringing the Netflix... I don't know if it's an original series, but I know it's on Netflix, called Norseman. Um, uh, Those who have been with us since the beginning remember Plebs, and it was a kind of a a sitcom set in ancient Rome. Well, this is in a very similar fashion. It's kind of a sitcom set in the Viking times and and Norse uh, times, and... uh, but the kind of the tropes and the jokes are more modern. So uh, I it, I started watching it. I was like, this is right for show show you know material. So I, I backed off. Um, but I thought it would be something fun to get into with you guys. So uh, Tony, what what do you have this time? I have Yellow Jackets brought to me by my sister. She's on it. This is uh, I guess it's going to be a split between two time periods. Uh, but the premise is. 1996, a New Jersey's high school soccer team is traveling to a tournament, and then while flying over Canada, their plane crashes and they're stranded, or their survivors are stranded for 19 months. And then it also, I think, has scenes 25 years later uh, on how their lives turned out. So I'm guessing it flips back and forth. On, That's uh, interesting. Between their survival and then how things are going in the present. 
or 2021. All I can think of is the book Hatchet when you started describing the plot. But anytime there's an airplane crash and people are surviving, I always think of the book Hatchet. I like that book. We had to read it for school, right? Mm Mm-hmm. All right, Jay, what about you? James. Well, Jay, um, whose mic is not working for some reason, has offered a show called Bluey on Disney+. Plus. Um, I am not really aware of anything about this show other than it seems to be the next generation of Blue's Clues. I see your mic is back. How are you? Sorry, guys. I uh, Just as I do in court every once in a while, I'll leave myself on mute and then just start talking. Uh, but... <laughs> Uh, I've, I put forward Bluey. It is an Australian animated series. It is it is a children's series, and you might think I am uh, doing another Siesta Key troll job, but I promise you I'm not. Uh, the the reason why is that this is by far my favorite show to watch with my kid because it works on so many levels, and not even in the in the way that Animaniacs or some of the Pixar movies work on different levels where there's just references and jokes out there for the parents that the kids won't necessarily get. It's more that the the episodes are really, really smartly written in that there is a, a surface storyline for the children and then there's often a, a deeper emotional kind of uh, story being told for the adults. So I'm... I'm genuinely interested to hear what you guys think about it, and to be a little honest, I also want to hear what Christy thinks about it. Okay. But, uh, uh, but yeah, so Bluey from Australia, just like Farscape. Well, then here we go. Let us shuffle and spin to win. Let's spin the McConaughey wheel. All right, 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 all right. Wheel of morality, spin, spin, spin. spin, spin. spin. <laughs> oh, oh, let's do it. Oh, man. I knew I shouldn't have done that. Blue, you my boy. <laughs> Bluey. I mean, I've only seen a couple episodes at your house, but I was like, this is a good show. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good show. Now, let's let's talk practicals about Bluey. Um, there are three seasons that have aired so far uh, for a total of 141 episodes. Now, the episodes are only eight minutes each. Okay. Uh, so there's a there's a few different ways we could do this. Uh, I if we only did say the first season, oh god, there's just so much more out there that I <laughs> that I that I want to uh, hear you guys' thoughts on. So we could, uh, I think we could do like selected episodes because uh, it, it's a kids show, so it's not exactly like it, it tells a linear story. Can I ask this question? Yeah. Do you want to create a curated list for us to go through and watch? Yeah, I think I think that would probably be, be the best way to go uh, to do it without doing all 141 episodes. Okay. So then you are going to find us a cu- or create for us a curated list, and then me and Tony and you are going to watch through that list. Yeah, if that works for you guys. I'm fine. Which works for me? Yep. All righty. Now, they're... It's also kind of similar to Farscape, where there are episodes that have aired in Australia that are not yet available in any form to American audiences, if you don't know where to look. Mm -hmm. Uh, So so uh, we'll we'll, we'll, uh, we'll get to that off the record. Very good. Bluey. This is going to be great. This is going to be great. (laughs) I'm so excited. I'm excited. I am open. All right. Well, it is, uh, at least in America, it is available for streaming on Disney+. Plus. Uh, so check out <laughs> some Bluey for real life. And, man, I am I'm so very excited about this. I want to uh, I wanna thank my two co-hosts for joining me here today. It's been so much fun talking about Farscape with you. You are welcome. And I'll be seeing you next time with some Bluey, and I will see you in the trees. In the blue hole. <laughs> You into Bluey yet? Huh? You into Bluey yet? Blue Clues? Blue Clues? Bluey, you'll get there.